Thank you for watching my virtual lecture recital. My topic is a selection of cello and piano chamber works by the Soviet composer Nikolai Kapustin. We will be performing Elegy, Op. 96, Burlesque, Op. 97, Nearly Waltz, Op. 98, and Sonata No. 2 for cello and piano, Op. 84. My pianist and collaborator on this project is Ria Yang. A few months ago, Ria sent me recordings of these works and suggested we perform them together, which led to this project. I am an avid listener of jazz and was very excited to be able to play in a jazz style, particularly because these works do not require improvisation, which is a skill I don't possess as a classically trained musician. This lecture will explore Kapustin's jazz classical fusion compositional style and explore the reasons his cello and piano works are not as regularly performed as those of other fusion composers. Nikolai Kapustin was born in 1937 in Horvlika, Ukraine, which at the time was part of the USSR. He grew up mostly in Horvlika, except for a period of two years during World War II. During that time, Kapustin's father was away fighting in the war, while Kapustin, his mother, and sister were evacuated to the city of Tokmak, Kyrgyzstan, during the German occupation of Ukraine. His whole family survived the war, but when they returned th to their home, they found it destroyed. Also, young Nikolai was prevented from returning to school for a year due to severe malnutrition. Around the same time, when Kapustin was around seven years old, he began playing the piano and taking lessons. In 1952, at age 14, he successfully auditioned for the Moscow Musical College, leaving his family to live in Moscow and study with Evralian Rubak. After his study at the Moscow Musical College, he went on to attend the prestigious Moscow Conservatory, studying with Alexander Goldenweiser beginning in 1956. During his time at the Musical College, Kapustin was living with the family of his friend Andrei Mikhailov. At their house, Nikolai and Andrei would secretly listen to a late-night radio program called Voice of America, which developed Kapustin's interest in jazz music. At the time, the Soviet government was disapproving of jazz for its American influence, which is why the radio program was listened to in secret. In her book, Conversations with Nikolai Kapustin, author Yana Chilkova discusses this radio program with Kapustin and recalled the well-known Russian phrase, quote, Today you are playing jazz, and tomorrow you will be a traitor of your motherland. Although not related to jazz, Kapustin was almost kicked out of the Moscow Musical College because he was considered to have created bourgeois art. During his second year of conservatory, a virus was going around Moscow, and the students of the Musical College were required to quarantine in their dorms, a very similar experience for us today. Kapustin and his friends were bored and put up paintings on the walls. The paintings were deemed bourgeois by the administration and they were almost expelled. Luckily, his professor intervened and they were saved from expulsion, but it provides a context for art and culture within the USSR. Before he graduated from the Moscow Conservatory, Kapustin was offered a position as the pianist in the Oleg Lundstrom Big Band. By the time Kapustin graduated and joined the band in 1961, the Khrushchev thaw had begun and the Ministry of Culture had recognized the Lundstrom Big Band as part of the system of the All-Russian State Concert Orchestra. The Lundstrom Big Band toured the Soviet Union, playing mostly popular Russian songs with occasional jazz standards. Almost all of the musicians in the band were skilled improvisers, including Kapustin. In addition to performing, Kapustin was also responsible for transcribing and arranging music for the band. Kapustin devoted hours to transcribing music uh, parts for the music of popular American big bands, like those of Count Basie, Glenn Miller, and Duke Ellington, because at the time none of this sheet music was available in Russia. Kapustin also arranged popular Russian songs and classical music for the band. At this time, Kapustin also had the opportunity to write some music for the Lundstrom band and for other bands. After a little over 10 years with the Lundstrom Big Band, he went on to play with the Karamyshev Orchestra and later the Russian State Symphony Orchestra of Cinematography. In 1984, Kapustin made the decision to leave the Orchestra of Cinematography and dedicated the rest of his career to composing and recording his works. Kapustin began composing when he was a student at the Moscow Conservatory. He began with a few solo piano works and began composing more regularly during his time with the Karamyshev Orchestra. Thus, a lot of his early work is for big band with strings. After dedicating himself solely to composition, the vast majority of his output was piano repertoire. He wrote 161 works with an opus number, including 20 piano sonatas, 
over 50 pieces for solo piano, and six piano concertos. In 1995, during the premiere of his fifth piano concerto, he met and became friendly with cellist Alexander Zagorinsky. Zagorinsky is a renowned cellist who has played with the Academic Symphony Orchestra of the Moscow Philharmonic and the Moscow Chamber Orchestra, has earned prizes at various national and international competitions, and now teaches at the Nesson Academy in Moscow. At the time of their meeting, Kapustin had already written his first cello sonata, Opus 63, so they played this work together and they made plans for future collaborations. The second cello sonata, Opus 84, which you will hear on our concert today, was dedicated to Zagorinsky. In addition to the two cello sonatas and three short pieces, Kapustin also wrote two solo cello pieces, two cello concertos, and a handful of chamber works featuring the cello, all of which were a direct result of the friendship and collaboration between the two musicians. Kapustin's music is difficult to categorize. Kapustin himself eschewed genre labels in comparisons to composers who intended to fuse jazz and classical music. Others have categorized his music as fusion or third stream jazz, but when asked whether he identifies his comp compositions in this way, he said no. Instead, he said, quote, I am a classical composer who uses jazz idioms in his style. Kapustin's classical influence is seen in the form and instrumentation of these works. A sonata for cello and piano is clearly a form taken from his classical training rather than the jazz tradition. Within the sonata we are playing, the first movement is a sonata form, the second movement is an intermezzo in ABA form, and the third movement is again in sonata form. The sonata forms are very standard, with expo expositional material, a middle development section, and finished with the recapitulation. The intermezzo is a short form, usually tucked between two larger movements or works, and this second movement is no exception. The three short pieces on our program, Elegy, Burlesque, and Nearly Waltz, are character pieces. Character pieces are short works in ABA form that portray a particular mood or scene and are a staple of the piano repertoire. Gabusin's three short pieces have descriptive titles that portray their character and are all in ABA prime form. Unlike many jazz forms, there is no opportunity for improvisation in these works. A lot of the flourishes and licks in these pieces sound improvisatory, but are written out for the performance to execute exactly as written. When asked about his per favorite composers during his time at the conservatory, he said, quote, my first big time favorite composer was Sergei Rachmaninoff, the second one was Ravel, and the third one was Bartok. Additionally, he performed major works by Rachmaninoff and Stravinsky at that time, and their influence is evident, though Kapustin dislikes to acknowledge it. For example, Kapustin's variations for piano, Opus 41, almost directly quotes the bassoon solo from the opening of the Rite of Spring. Despite the similarity, Kapustin said, I don't accept the fact that I used Stravinsky's theme from the Rite of Spring. I wasn't thinking about him at all when I was composing the piece. A similar quote appears in the development section of the third movement of Cello Sonata No. 2. My guess is that, that the composer would also write this off as a coincidence. Nonetheless, the classical influence is there. When asked about the similar tonal relationships between his Etudes, Opus 40, and Beethoven's Bagatelles, Kapustin said, quote, I do admire Beethoven, though, although the way my music goes, I would see probably more connection to the Russian music, particular to, p particularly to the music of Sergei Rachmaninoff. While Kapustin was classically trained, his compositions use jazz idioms. Melodically, his work uses frequent blue notes, meaning flat third, fifth, and seventh scale degrees. 
This is apparent in the primary theme of the last movement of the sonata, which uses A flat, C flat, and E flat in the key of F in the cello melody. When asked who influenced him, Kabusin said, quote, I listened to a lot of Oscar Peterson's improvisations. Bill Evans, I felt at the time, was a little far from me. He seemed to be too lyrical, but later I changed my attitude towards him and began to really appreciate his music. In general, I listened to a lot of different styles of music, for example, the music of Herbie Hancock, Lenny Tristano, McCoy Tyner, and Quincy Jones. As a result of this influence, many of Kabusin's melodies are reminiscent of American jazz standards. For example, the B-section melody in Nearly Waltz is very similar to the original version of Fly Me to the, Room, Fly Me to the Moon, written by Bard Howard and popularized by Frank Sinatra. Fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. In Kapustin's Piano Concerto, number two, opus 14, there's another possible quote of Gershwin's jazz standards, jazz standard, I got rhythm. <laughs> said of Gershwin, quote, for some reason people always compare my music with the music of Gershwin. I am already tired of it. And quote, it's not a pleasant thing. Despite these similarities, Kapusin resisted comparisons made between his work and the work of similar composers. Rhythmically, Kapusin's works are highly syncopated with frequent metric modulations and accents on offbeats. Additionally, passages of eighth notes or sixteenth notes are frequently swung. Occasionally, the music will be marked with the instruction to swing, but more often it is intuited by the performer. When asked about Kapustin and his music, pianist Mark Andre Hamlin summarized Kapustin's style and the challenges of playing his music. Quote, the music of Kapustin is one of the most successful fusions of classical and jazz that I know. Normally, classical jazz fusions are very lopsided to either the classical or the jazz, but Kapustin manages a rather equal balance of classical form with jazz language. The only composer that I can think of who managed something comparable is Bernstein. It's a lot of fun playing Kapustin's music, but there's a big challenge for classical players. How do you swing? It's a profoundly different sense of how rhythm works. Even ha after having listened to years and years of jazz and mucking about with playing jazz a great deal, I still can't properly do it, but that's a big part of the fun, searching for the groove. Kapustin's music also employs extended chords with ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths. In just one of many examples, the last two chords in Sonata Number no. 2, pictured here, are C13, flat 5, flat 9 in third inversion, and F dominant 7, sharp 9. These dense chromatic harmonies are a core part of the jazz sound. While Kapustin's piano works have become widely performed and listened to, his cello works are not yet standards of the repertoire. While Kapustin seemed to dislike comparisons to other composers, I think an, I think an apt comparison can be made between his cello works and Piazzolla's Le Grand Tango for cello and piano. Le Grand Tango is a work that fuses tango idioms with classical forms and instrumentation in the same way that Kapustin fuses jazz and classical styles. Most classically trained cellists have the same, tend to have the same level of experience in playing tango style as in playing jazz style, which is to say little to none. Despite this similarity, the Grand Tango has become a staple of the repertoire, while cello works of Kapustin are still relatively rare. The primary reason for this is the lack of awareness of Kapustin's music for instruments other than piano. Kapustin's piano works have been championed by performers both in Russia and in the West. Some of his compositions have been performed at top international piano competitions such as Van Cliburn. 
His first cello works, Sonata No. 1 and No. 2, premiered in 1997, have not yet received the same treatment. In contrast, Le Grand Tango was written for and premiered by Mitsislav Rostropovich, one of the most internationally famous cellists of the 20th century. Rostropovich premiered the work in 1990 and recorded it in 1996, but it seems his international recognition allowed the piece to become a standard cello work in the last three decades, while Kapustin's works have not. Another reason Kapustin's cello works have been neglected is the lack of access to Kapustin's cello repertoire. In my research, I used the Internet Archive to find the now-defunct Kapustin Society website. Looking for someone with first-hand knowledge of Kapustin to interview, I came across the contact information for Wim DeHaan, the Kapustin Society webmaster. Mr. DeHaan was kind enough to send me parts to Kapustin's solo suite for cello and some of his other chamber music featuring the cello, all of which is not readily available to purchase in the United States. Additionally, the performance notes on the solo suite are only in Russian. While he was alive, Kapustin had publishing disputes with both his Russian and Japanese publishers, resulting in his switch to shot music. Mr. Dahan gave me the contact information of Robert Schaefer at Shot Music. In order to access Kapustin's string quartet number no. one for an upcoming project of mine, Mr. Schaefer sent me a photocopy of the manuscript, as the work is not yet published by Schott. While working on Sonata number no. two for this performance, I also asked Mr. Schaefer for access to the manuscript of this work. I wanted to check in on a hunch I had about some misprints in the Schott edition. I discovered that the shot edition of this work has at least 15 errors in the cello part and approximately 12 in the piano part. This tally doesn't even include bowing discrepancies or Zagrinsky's original fingerings, which are missing from the shot edition. Yet another reason these works are neglected is the immense technical difficulty and awkwardness of the writing. For my research, Wim DeHaan also gave me the email address of cellist Agar Alexander Zagorinsky. Mr. Zagorinsky generously agreed to answer my questions about his collaboration and friendship with Kapustin. Through our email correspondence, Zagorinsky provided me greater context about Kapustin and his cello works. From all of my research, I was under the impression that Kapustin was a completely self-taught composer. In Kapustin's last year at the musical college, Kachaturian asked him to study composition when he enrolled in the Moscow Conservatory, but he refused. When asked about this decision, Kapustin said, quote, I believe that it is impossible to teach how to compose the music. It's either there or it's not. For her book, Chilkova asked him, have you ever tried to study composition? To which he replied, quote, never. I'm a self-taught composer, same as J.S. Bach. I asked Zagorinsky about Kapustin's level of knowledge of the cello as a self-taught composer. He said, quote, Kapustin tricked us a little bit that he was self-taught. He did not finish conservatory as a composer, but received a brilliant education at the Moscow Conservatory, not only as a pianist, but as a composer, attending the classes of outstanding Soviet composers. Previously, I had been under the impression that as a self-taught composer, Kapustin presumably lacked a working knowledge of cello technique until his meeting with Zagorinsky. In Chilkova's book, Kapustin speculated that the second cello sonata has become more popular than the first, because by then he had a better knowledge of the instrument. Kapustin provides more context. He says, Kapustin was very erudite, educated, and knew very well the subtleties of professional composing skills. He understood very well the specifics of cello technique. I gave him the J.S. Box cello suites to study. This contributed to the further writing of the most complex solo cello suites and compositions, introduction and scherzo. He also said, quote, of course, he asked me about the possibilities of performing various difficult passages on the cello. Zagorinsky also explained the difficulties in Kabusin's style with a comparison to Bach. He said, quote, in order to play with such a musician, it was necessary for one to make technical, specific progress and practice a lot on the cello. It was necessary to feel the character of the style, to play the cello like Grappelli played the violin. Only cello technique was more time consuming. Many shifts from from position to position, bow technique also necessitates larger movements than on the violin. In order to play one of Kapusin's compositions, it was necessary to possess a solid technical bass, virtuosity, as well as feel the jazz rhythm and style of improvisation. All of these attributes are not so easy to pick up. This is a big effort in the development of one's technique. But even the composer had unrivaled technique on the piano. 
and many generations of musicians will be interested in achieving for themselves this level of virtuosity, dexterity, feeling of rhythm, professional understanding, and areas of jazz art. This is a highly professional path in mastering the possibilities of instrumental art. In this sense, Kapusin's creativity can be compared to the creativity of J.S. Bach, who, in the exact same way, gave the basis for the development of virtu virtuoso technique of various instruments. The comparison to Bach continues in the title of these three short pieces we will play today. I asked him if he knew of any particular inspiration of the, for these pieces, and Zagorinsky said, the names are given for their precise connection to the character of dance rhythms, similar to Bach in his suites. Before the insight from Zagorinsky, I had concluded that the awkward writing in the cello part was a result of Kapustin's lack of understanding of what is comfortable to play on the cello. When writing sonatas for cello and piano, most pianist com composers take advantage of the long sustained lines that are not possible on piano. Instead, because of the frequent syncopation in jazz, Kapustin's cello lines are much more active with frequent bow changes and frequent changes in range. One difficulty with executing this is uneven bowings, meaning a phrase might alternate between short bows and long bows with little time to recover to a comfortable part of the bow to sing the phrase. Of course, trying players encounter this kind of unrealistic bowing pattern in the music of classical composers like Beethoven and Brahms. But in those classical styles of music, there's a long tradition of performers altering bowings for a well-executed phrase. It's harder for me as a classical cellist to revise the bowing and still maintain the style because the frequent bow changes are often necessary to execute these accents and syncopations in Kabusin's music. Swung eighth notes and sixteenth notes are another example of this. In order to swing, the notes must be uneven, and thus the bowing becomes uneven. Both the range and frequent use of uncomfortable chords and double stops present another challenge to the cellist. The range of cello parts on this recital are mostly in tenor or treble clef range, except for when the cello plays a pizzicato bass line, filling the role of upright bass in a jazz combo. While the third movement of the sonata starts with a relatively lower cello melody, it's in the middle range of the instrument that doesn't project well, especially when competing with the incredibly dense piano texture. Even when the whole piece is in a high range of the cello, Kapustin's melodies often require very frequent shifts of position, like in the melody of Nearly Waltz. Additionally, Kapustin writes uncomfortable double stops and chords throughout the second sonata. For example, in the development of the third movement of the sonata, Kapustin asks for this chord. In order to execute that, I would have to put my hand in a very uncomfortable formation with only one beat of preparation. I can imagine that most composition teachers would not allow their students to write this for the cello, and most cellists I know would suggest another voicing of the chord. Regardless, thanks to the insight of Zagorinsky, it is clear that Kapusin's cello writing was not that of a pianist unknowingly asking for unrealistic things from his cellist but rather someone who demanded intense technical and musical skill from his cellist. After all, when preparing to premiere the first sonata, Zagrinsky said they rehearsed for six months in pre preparation for their German tour, on which they played both Kapustin sonatas and other towering classical works. The duo, the duo rehearsed for about an entire year. However, while the intended level of difficulty is high, it is my opinion that there are instances of extreme awkwardness in the writing. I believe that Kapustin, I believe the difficulty that Kapustin demands in these places doesn't contribute to the beauty or virtuosity of the music. In some cases, it hinders it. Because of this, in a handful of spots, I've chosen to exclude a note from a chord or a double stop. In these instances, the note was already present in the piano part, and the best efforts to play all of the pitches led to either poor sound quality, poor intonation, or both. I know Rhea has made similar choices in the piano part because of extreme changes of range or issues of endurance. In closing, I feel that Kapustin's works for cello would be a great addition to the canon of cello repertoire. I really have enjoyed becoming acquainted with Kapustin's music, and my hope is that his music, especially his music for chamber ensembles, will gain greater recognition in the classical world. I also hope that Schott would be able to publish critical editions of his cello and chamber works, complete with original fingerings and bowings, so that these works can be both widely accessible and accurate. In closing, I would like to thank Rhea Yang for her tireless work on this project. For contributing to my research, I would like to thank Wim DeHaan, Robert Schaefer, and Alexander Zagorinsky. 
Special thanks to Misha Tenser for help with translating Mr. Zagorinsky's email. I would also like to thank Dr. Kutz and Professor Rita Sloan for their guidance in putting together this program. Thank you, thank you for watching my lecture and I hope you enjoy the performance.